welcome to The Simple Actor. Okay, here we go. Hey guys, welcome back to The Simple Actor. I'm Shante, and I'm here today with an awesome, awesome friend and colleague, Natalie Watchin. She is a wonderful actress, currently based in LA, who has graced the stage and screen in shows such as Rent, Murder Ballad, and Boardwalk Empire. Um, she does many things. <laughs> <laughs> Some of which are just, I, I love this group that she's created called the Noels because um, we're in holiday season, um, but she's fabulous. She's an actress, she's a producer, and she has a lot, I think, to share about our topic today, which is beauty standards in the industry, um, especially for BIPOC actors and actresses out there. Um, so we want to get into it. Welcome, Natalie. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm so uh, happy to see you. And also, <laughs> it is, it's is—it's weird to hear somebody talk about me and I'm just over here. I can't hide. Don't hide. Don't hide. I wanted to say the whole thing. Like I was reading your entire bio. The fact that you constantly get mistaken for Sandra from the Cosby show made me laugh. So I, people would yell at me, especially in New York, because you know, you're just out on the street all the time. People would be like, Cosby show. And like, Huxable, Sandra. I, and it would happen also people who knew her would come up to me and say like you know you remind me of a dear friend of mine she's an actress you probably have never heard of her i'm like sabrina labeouf and they're like yeah she's my best friend i had a makeup artist for headshots who was like i stay at her house all the time i collect her residuals while she's out of town i feel like i've already done your makeup for my whole life and i met the guy who played elvin at the telsey office at a commercial audition and he, was he, he like looked, you look like her he looked at me like I walked out of a time machine and said, what's your last name? <laughs> and I was like, I feel like I know you. He's like, oh, I feel like I know you. I'll tell you why as soon as we do this. We went in, auditioned for like husband and wife and some credit card commercial that neither one of us booked. <laughs> but how can we possibly book it if it's Sandra and Elvin? <laughs> I can't stop laughing. <laughs> and yeah. it's true. As soon as I read it, I was like, oh, yeah, of course all the time i'd love to do something with her i like her a lot i've seen her off broadway I really think she's fantastic. well yeah. if they ever do i mean i don't think they'll be doing a cosmic reboot anytime soon but um no i just think they, they are. are what well, no. I think, well i think they're doing a different world reboot well and it, you know it may not happen a different world reboot but like a prequel with cliff and claire oh really that's okay. just rumor though i don't know if it's really happening Okay, well, you get in that room because <laughs> I don't know. I don't know who I would be in there. <laughs> the ghost of their future daughter comes to visit their, their future daughter. Right, right. Oh man. Oh my gosh. But um, no, Natalie's awesome, you guys. And Natalie and I met in uh and murder ballot. We were both covering uh, the leads of Murder Ballad back in New York, back in the day. And we just spent a lot of hours laughing and singing and I think watching videos. <laughs> watching videos, playing Boggle. <laughs> playing Boggle. We had a good time. We had a good time in that show, um, but she's good peeps. So Nat, I want to jump in because I want to keep laughing, but <laughs> <laughs> I feel like going to beauty standards is like so serious, but can we talk? Can we yes. talk about standards? Yeah, and maybe we can laugh about it. Maybe it'll hopefully. It'll feel but I think we have some stories to share. So, can you talk a little bit about you starting out in the industry, kind of what the standards were then, and how how they've changed? Like, what's been your beauty journey in the business? I, you know, when I first started auditioning for stuff, I was pretty young, and I think I was. I think I was 19. I had like just gotten enough money to get a car, get my headshots and start auditioning for things. And I thought I was going to be going out for like all the 18 to play younger stuff that my friends had been doing. Cause I grew up in LA, had a lot of actor friends, but I was so tall that that was out of the question. So then my, I had no idea how much the way I looked would really affect things career wise. It just didn't cross my mind because I thought I'm a funny person. I'm an actor. I'm a teenager. I'm going to just be on Nickelodeon. Uh, and I just was, I didn't look enough like a kid. Uh, so there was that. And then I went on my first audition with a brand new agent and it was like a modeling thing. And I walked into this room, my little five, seven and a half self was the shortest person there. 
everyone was like the same weight as me, but like five inches taller. And I got out of that. And the whole audition was just like, stand there and turn around in a circle while we just pan up and down your body. And I went straight to my best friend's house and just cried. And I was like, is this what it is? <laughs> like, I can't have it be all about the way I look. Wound up booking it. And then they, when I got to set, I walk into the trailer and the wardrobe lady says, what are you an eight? Like looks me up and down and says, what are you an eight? Like an eight is like the worst thing you could be. And I was like a four at the time. And she, I, I like, I, I show up happy to have my first job for my first audition. And some lady is just like, you look unacceptable. And also unacceptable is below average. So that it was, I knew that that was a crazy thing, but it was my very first thing. And I was like, I will not internalize this. I will not latch onto this. I will not try to get skinnier than I am. I'm already skinny and I shouldn't have to be, I shouldn't have to need to be skinny to work. But it was still a really tough thing to hear on your first gig. And then when we were shooting, <laughs> we were shooting this scene at the beach and they had a lot of people in the foreground and this one other actor model guy and I had to just keep walking further and further from the camera. Like we're looking out at the, at the water. Other people are having the party on the beach in the forefront of the picture. And the DP just keeps waving us back further, further, go to, go to the water. So I'm like facing away from the camera, <laughs> barely a little silhouette in the back with my size four slash size eight self. And that was really hard not to internalize. And if I wasn't already so grounded as I was as a teenager, that could have been really damaging. Mm -hmm. And it could have really affected the way that I walked into rooms in the future and what I ate and how I exercised and all that. Mm -hmm. But I thought it was kind of hilarious. Wow, wow. So after this crazy speech experience where you're like, I'm ready for the next one, or were you just like, okay, I, I, you, like you said, I'm okay with me, but how did you go to the next gig? Did anything change at all for you? Well, I did tell my agent, I didn't want to do any more print work ah. uh, because I thought, okay, maybe that's a print experience, mm. but really it does go across all entertainment as far as I found it. Yeah. Uh, how I look has affected my casting in ways that were surprising to me too like being a light skinned black woman has been really interesting mm -hmm. because when I am in a cast that is predominantly white, then I often play a character who's either low status or fades into the background. Uh, and if I'm in a cast that is all black, then I often play high status, rich, snobby, um, desirable, the cute one, the ingenue. I'll never be an ingenue in a, a white show, or I shouldn't say never will be, but I rarely have been an ingenue in a white show. So that's, that's also a really weird place to be. And that can mess with your head too. Wow. And I, with this, I mean, with colorism, I mean, let's just be real, like mm. everybody on that spectrum, like has issues with that right like so if you're darker skinned you're like i'm getting cast as dot 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 and if you're lighter skinned you're falling in between the cracks mm -hmm. um have has have you ever experienced this idea of where people say look natalie you're the ideal right like i remember when natural hair was like coming in vogue <laughs> like not that long ago right um mm -hmm. when people stop straightening their hair so much and i remember people being like thinking everybody's natural hair would be like these ringlets, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, I don't think I have those. <laughs> I'm not sure. But what you gotta wait. Mean? You gotta stop relaxing it and wait. You to gotta slow, stop slow relaxing crawl. to wait to even see if you have it. But people just assume, like, I remember white casting people being like, oh, natural hair looks like this. And I was like, yeah. I'm not sure though. But like, sometimes they do and you do i remember meeting you and thinking she has the dopest hair like your hair was just like curly perfect have you ever gotten like pushback from people saying look natalie you're actually getting the upside of this you've got this curly ringlets you know your lighter skin have you ever had any negative um feedback for that reason yeah it, i mean it really just depends on the beholder as we call them you know beauty's in the eye of the beholder 
and you're really hit over the head with your proximity to whiteness and mm -hmm. what that means from different points of view. Uh, so depending on who's looking at you, who's casting you, who they're casting you against, uh, the, the farther you are away from white on one side of the spectrum is the worst. And the closer you are to white on the other side of the spectrum is either the best or sometimes the, just the, the most white. So whether that can be the most stuck up or the most wealthy, um, it's just this, this whole stereotypical status thing that, that we deal with. Um, it, it, you get it, I get it from both sides. Yeah, and that's that's so interesting because even just having whiteness be the centering focus, mm -hmm. of like where am I on that line as you've mm -hmm. experienced in your roles? Um, how do you even shift that? <laughs> you, you know, know I, I honestly stopped auditioning for several years because I was so uh, frustrated by it. Uh, and the scripts I was seeing I couldn't stop seeing that I, and uh, and I didn't want to be a part of of telling some of those stories, especially from the white perspective. Uh, so I just stopped. I, it got to me too much. I told my all my reps that I wanted to take two weeks off after one pilot season. I had just seen so many scripts where I was like, I don't want I can't put my body, my face, my voice into this story, into this character, this depiction of a woman, this depiction of a black woman. Mm. I can't do it. Uh, and then those two weeks became four weeks, became I think four years maybe. Uh, and then that's when I started making more of my own stuff also. Uh, and the stuff that I produce has been, uh, it's it's been diverse, but primarily it's, been creating work for black women that's fabulous and did you start creating your work with that in mind like i want to create work for me or just black women or is that just automatically just the work that started coming out of you you know uh, there were many factors in it one is i wanted to sort of celebrate black women who inspired me uh so some of the, a lot of the stuff that i do pays homage to different black women in entertainment and in music. Uh, but also I have a lot of friends who have played the same roles I have, even sometimes at the same time, but we could never be in shows together because we were always the one. <laughs> so I was like, the All token, right. the token. Yeah. I mean, just being the token. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's like, if there are two of us, then it's not a token anymore. Yes. So, <laughs> so I was like, all right we're just going to, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to make this thing five, five black women. And so we did it one year. And then the next year we added more black women. We still go out in groups of five. Yeah. Uh, but since the time we started in 2016 to now, even with that weird dip in 2020, where we couldn't do live entertainment, um, we probably had 20, 20 different singers in that one group. And then I have another group that has three singers some of them are the same as in the the five part group uh but but yeah i was just was like can we all get together and make money together and harmonize together and nobody knew what i was talking about isn't like, that wild mean? though that it's, it's <laughs> it was such a foreign concept outside of being in an all kind of black show mm -hmm. essentially like there wasn't there weren't there aren't many opportunities for us to be multiple us, which is why I think I gravitated so much to you and Murderbell. I was like, there's two of us in this like four casting, person show. And I loved it. That casting was so great because it, it didn't great. matter. We were both understudying Casey and we're yeah. both understudying Rebecca. Yeah. And Casey didn't look like the person who originated the role, no. Karen. No. Um, it, yeah, it was just like, I really loved working with that director. I yeah. really loved that the look really wasn't a part of it. Yeah, Trip really kind of trusted that the right actors were the right actors, and um, each person would just tell their own story story in their own way and make the narrative shift depending on yeah. who was in it. And he trusted that process, each of us, to kind of bring that to the table, which I loved. I loved it. It was really yeah. inspiring and encouraging too yeah. to see a, a director be able to 
actually not really care what we looked like. Yeah, yeah, that was amazing. But so this idea that you're like, let's get us all together because we don't get to do this. Usually we're the onlys and people are like, what are you talking about? Yeah, I mean, not like we all thought it was a perfectly fine idea. We would like to sing together. We'd like to harmonize together. But I was like, all right, so let's have an all black, all female acapella group just for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> so people didn't know what I was talking about. It was hard to sell the first year. But when you think about caroling groups, you think about the hoop skirts and the top hats and the four part harmony, the Dickensian style. Yeah. And they're not singing my favorite Christmas music. I love Christmas music, but I love the Ronettes. I love Darlene Love. I love Chuck Berry. I love Stevie Wonder, Donny Hathaway. And that wasn't happening. I felt like there was a need for that. I felt like there was a market for that. And so that's what we started doing. Uh, it was still hard for me to explain to people what it was. So I made a, this little video. I had uh, my friend's husband is a, an illustrator and an artist. So he made this little um, cartoon of like five black girls, Christmassy glamorous. And I just sang into GarageBand, all five parts and put a little video up with the cartoons because we hadn't even had a rehearsal yet. So it was just, five of me and the little cartoon I put it on Facebook and sent it a few places and people were like you girls sound great how much do you cost <laughs> this is what you call entrepreneur right here this is entrepreneur all the way you just gotta sometimes you just have to make moves <laughs> and, and so and you know my my friends knew about it and we booked uh our first book our first booking was at Brotherhood Crusade uh, they have an annual awards dinner where they honor um, like a pillar of the black community. And so we were really at home there. And the response that we got to that very first gig was more emotional than we had expected. Because people are not used to seeing five glamorous black women show up together, harmonize together and celebrate together. It was lovely. And also there is that throwback aspect to it because we um, it's, we give a really big nod to the girl group of girl groups of the sixties with our name and our style and everything. So there's that nostalgia to it as well. And, uh, we just kept growing from there. That's amazing. That's amazing. I'm that's amazing. Um, and when it's people really have this emotional reaction, was it just, what do you think that was? You know, I'm trying to think back what there, there's one lady in particular who cried while we were singing on the red carpet and then she hired us for a couple of things in the future too. Um, and I'm trying to remember exactly what she said, but people just miss positive depictions mm -hmm. of black women, friendly black women, loving each other, cooperating with each other, harmonizing with each other. Um, it's nice to see, like we see it in real life, but it doesn't happen in entertainment as much. Mm. Uh, and I think, I think there's a really visceral reaction to that for some people. Yeah. That's so worth beautiful. like, yeah, this is real. Like if people feel seen, they, people feel celebrated. Yeah. And this idea of just celebrated seeing representation, right? Mm -hmm. um, this idea of when you're putting together your group, and looking at, we're just finding glamorous black women, how much does, you know, shape and body come into play? Because a lot of times when I'm talking to like my family back in Virginia, you know, they're like curvy black women, beautiful, right? Um, yeah. And then you have, again, the beauty standards of what I would call like Hollywood, LA TV film, whatever, um, you know, it's like tiny and stick like and so you know how much are you saying we're going to celebrate the curves we're going to celebrate you know all the things all the full diaspora of what we can be it's it's honestly not even a discussion there is a dress size for everybody i got so many sizes of gowns and if i don't have a size you know somebody auditions or someone gets referred and i don't have a dress for you then i'll buy a dress for you mm. i have uh from extra small to 2XL. And if I need a different size, I'll get a different size. Mm. Because it's, it, we're 
all beautiful. We can all be glamorous. It's not, it really has nothing to do with what shape you are. Yeah, no, that's, that's amazing. Um, dude, everybody book the Noels this season. <laughs> <laughs> Like everybody, I'm just like, I'm like support I'm... the cause, please, people. Yes, and we do have we have a few shows happening. I don't know when you're actually going to put this up, so I don't know about our few shows. But if you if you follow us on Instagram, we will be posting about the public shows that we do. Uh, we always do the LA Farmers Market, so we'll be doing that the the week of Christmas. And we have a, a theater show up in Oxnard. People can see if they're up in the valley. Um, that's free to the public, also. Um, so we talked a little bit about like body stuff. And I, I just want to throw in, you know, for me, I, I mean, I was like that size two green smoothie yogi <laughs> when I was, you know, living in Brooklyn and doing all the things. Um, and then that, that shifted. And I remember going into studios over time. And again, used to being the token used to being, um, you know, the black girl that was quote unquote, people had deemed pretty enough to audition mm -hmm. for lead roles. And even that spectrum is just like, what does that even mean? Like Gabby Union talks about that, even though she mm -hmm. was dark skinned, people said, well, you're pretty enough um, to have a shot. And what yeah. does that mean? You know, we're talking about beauty in relation to whiteness and how to kind of shift that. Um, but I remember having this moment where I was, I had gone and done a workshop, um, the Sundance Festival. And there they had showed us this video of good hair. <laughs> it was Chris Rock's good hair movie. Mm -hmm. And I was like all about the weave. I was all about the everything. And I was like, I don't want to do it anymore. I'm going to go back and I'm just going to be me. <laughs> like, I'm like, I'm ready for it. And I remember the first time I walked into ABC for like a pilot audition and did not look like my headshot again another part of the industry as we were discussing <laughs> like if you're going to make some drastic change you're like gotta think about that but i just remember thinking i feel amazing i look amazing and i remember walking into the casting office and people were just like what happened <laughs> what happened <laughs> and i was like what are you talking happened? about i mean what yeah what it was it was like a what happened moment and i was like what are you talking about i'm still me i'm just a little different, not that much. My hair was short anyways. Um, and they were just like, oh, okay. And it was like, I got treated like a different person. Like mm -hmm. it was like night and day. And it was not the only time. Um, I was auditioning for Pippin at the time and some other things. And I remember um, I had the short pixie cut headshot and I just had short natural hair. It wasn't super different, could have gotten a new headshot, but there definitely was a lot of like, wow okay like you're a different person now and i was like wow really is it like that and i felt like it it completely changed it went from you were pretty enough to be the leading lady to like maybe not anymore yeah like it's overnight. Like, right because they're like oh you're blacker now you're blacker now yeah <laughs> like oh you're blacker <laughs> you're black right. and blacker yeah, you crossed like, over that. You crossed over you, that. I like, crossed over that line and it was like a er, Shantae. And I was like, I've been seeing you people, like the same people for like seven or eight years. Like nothing changed overnight except for one thing. And that was it. And that was a big deal. Um, so, you know, stuff like that is just like traumatic, you know? And I was sharing with a makeup artist about some stuff that had happened with the soap opera, which was my first kind of big TV thing. And I was on it for two years and it was like trauma, like being that young and being like 20, you know, I think it was 25 or 26, which is like young in New York. And just having someone say, I don't know what to do with your face. <laughs> Like literally, like, I don't know what to do with your face. And it's like, what's wrong with my face? And I wasn't as secure as you. I wasn't as secure as you, you know? And I, I totally flipped because I grew up in the country as this kind of thick country girl. I was running around outside in the woods. I ate bacon and, you know, I didn't have any of that stuff in the theater. And it really was once I crossed over to kind of TV and film stuff after being an actress in New York that I was like, oh, should I change something? Is this not working out? And that really threw me. That really threw me. I can imagine. 
I've never had anybody say, I don't know what to do with your face, but I have had people who pretended they knew what to do with my face and hair (laughs) when they did not. I have done multiple jobs on real network television and, and film that I can't, I couldn't use a clip from. And you know, when you're, you're trying to get, you're trying to get your credits, you're trying trying to get get your face out there. You're trying to get clips for your reel and so your agent can send out. And then you have clips where you're in some weird orange makeup or your hair is crazy and you can't use it because you don't feel like it's a good representation of you. And it just makes life more expensive. Then you start thinking about like, okay, well, I should just style myself or hire a different makeup person and then pay thousands of dollars for some real to some real company to shoot something when like, no, I booked a bunch of co-stars and guest stars, but I have nothing to show for it. Isn't that something like, and even just the mental energy that takes to show up to set. And I remember early mornings being like, I have to get up two hours ahead just to do my hair, just to Mm. be prepped, to go in and bring extra makeup in case someone does something crazy to my face. Like how much mental energy does that take away from like doing the job? Right. Because (laughs) there are people, there are actresses who walk in and all they do is their job as an actress. Yeah. But we also have to be prepared to either just look bad and not be able to use it or redo our own hair and makeup, spend money on, on high quality products that are going to look good in HD Mm -hmm. and then sneak off to our trailer and try to do something to fix ourselves without making anybody mad. Yeah. Because now we're changing their, their stuff. The last thing I got, um, I won't say what it is. (laughs) 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 Yeah. Yeah. But the last thing I shot, I ran into a similar situation where someone was just didn't want to admit they had no idea how to handle my hair and I'm walking around popping bobby pins are popping out of my hair because my hair is rejecting them because they don't know how to make things stay it's not in a I can tell the shape that it's in is not the shape they mean for it to be in yeah and I don't know what to do about it and because of the way our location was and the trailers were it was really hard to just go sneak off and fix it then the person in charge pretended oh yeah oh I'm too busy to have my assistant do it to see if maybe the assistant would know how to do it they didn't it it was it's it's a whole thing and then you wonder you worry if you're going to get cut out of the final product you're going to get cut out because you don't look good enough and they're not going to mess with your residuals right it's expensive it is it is more expensive to be a black actress than it is to be a white actress Um. You just said it. Can you say that one more time, please? It is more expensive to be a Black actress than it is to be a white actress.